this morning. We bless your name for who you are. And we thank you for your loving kindness. We thank you for giving us another privilege to gather together in your presence to learn at your feet to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church and uh, to churches. And we pray that, Lord, your Spirit will enact our spirit this morning, enabling us to catch the fire of the Holy Ghost so that we can run this race the way you want us to run it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 By the grace of God, last week I started a teaching that I titled The Three Types of Congregations That We Need to Watch Out For you know, in the Body of Christ. And I remember telling us vividly that um, one of it is the Congregation of the Righteous, the second one is the Congregation of Sinners, and the third one is the Congregation of the... Huh? The dead. The dead. All right. You remember. So I remember teaching holy on the congregation of the dead last week. So today I'm going to trust God I'll be able to finish it. I'll be talking about the congregation of sinners intertwined with the congregation of, of, right, of the righteous. Amen. 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 Yeah, so the congregation of sinners really it's also the congregation of the wicked. And we're going to see that in a moment as the Holy Spirit leads us in, in His Word. Amen. Psalm 22, verse, from verse 16. Psalm 22 from verse 16 speaks. David was speaking prophetically here, but it's also applicable to him as a person because the scripture has a manifold interpretation. It has many sides of its interpretation. But when you read, when you hear the way we read the scriptures, you will know that David was actually talking about Jesus. It was a prophetic scripture. So I read from verse 16. He said, For dogs have surrounded me, the congregation of the wicked has enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. That is apparently, obviously talking about Jesus Christ. Alright? But let's continue. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. But you, O oh Lord, do not be far from me. O oh, my strength, hasten to help me. Deliver me from the sword my precious life from the power of the dog. Now I want you to underline that word power of the dog in your Bible. And if you go back to verse 16 it says, for dogs have surrounded me. Now in verse uh, 17 it says, I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. The looking and the staring here is not to admire him. It's to ridicule him and to, and to look at him in despair. Amen. Amen. Now, we're going to be talking a little bit about, you know, why God used some animals as symbols in the Bible. Amen. Amen. Because it's very crucial for us to understand. If you go to the internet or to Google the characteristics of, uh, of dogs, what I'm about to talk, what I'm about to talk on you won't find it there. Amen. You will see a lot of things about talking about how dog is emotional, you know, how good dog is, alright? But I'm going to tell you the spiritual characteristics of dogs. That humans are embedded into their own personal life. Which is causing trouble. What was it that David saw When he said, the dogs have surrounded me, what did he say? And in verse 20 he said, deliver me from the sword, from the, my precious life, from the power of the dog. Now, like I said earlier, one of the, the characteristics of dog that I know listed in Google search is that it is called shamelessness. 
dogs, although this, this act is actually uh, 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 peculiar to all animals, so to speak. Shamelessness when they are mating. They don't care where they want to mate, they just go ahead and mate. Which some humans have adopted in their character when it comes to sexual perversion. Humans have adopted this kind of character. I mean, they, they don't they don't they don't think about sanity. There's no sanity in their mind. Some men can sleep with anything in skirt. You know what that means? That's sexual perversion. We, you know, humans now openly made, you know, like animals. They don't have shame. These are acts of sinful nature which the scripture says it has surrounded him. David speaking here. That is why, see, for those to have surrounded him, it means the congregation of the wicked has enclosed. The, the, the shamelessness of the act of sin is no it, it's now in the open. It, it, nobody feels shameful for sinning against God. And it is worrisome because some of these people, if not most, you find them in church also. Some of them are deacons and dignesses. Some of them are even pastors. Some of them are priests. Some of them are, you know, are preachers. You know, some of them, and we have them in the church also. But they form the congregation of sinners, not the congregation of the righteous. Even though they congregate, but their congregation is not unto God. So it's talking about like sins of adultery and fornication that has become rampant, not just rampant, it has become something we water down in the church because. Even the pastors also engage in such. And these are the things we need to look at this morning. So that we can watch ourselves. So that we can find ourselves holy in the presence of God. You do not know how wicked we were before we came into Christ. A wicked person does not care. The feelings of the other person. I don't know if you understand what that. I mean, when somebody is wicked at heart, they don't. All they care is about their own feelings, and they don't care about other people's feelings. They, they tremble, they pain, they cause. It's nothing. And that was our attitude before we came into Christ. Before we know Christ, we just want to satisfy our own selfish desires regardless of how God feels. Regardless of how Jesus feels because he already paid the price on the cross of Calvary. We don't care about it. People are still living in that dimension up till tomorrow. As sinners, we hurt God. We cause him pain. And most of the time, our action speaks volume by first of all ignoring his personality. I don't know if you understand. When, when, if you enter a place and people ignore your presence, you will never feel good, would you? Like my daughter would say, hey, you got to read the room, you know. Once you get into a place and you read the atmosphere, that it looks as if you are not welcome in here, what do you do? You dust your feet and you leave immediately. Now the point is, most of the times God approaches us, but he doesn't feel welcome. That is what the congregation of sinners does. God is speaking to them, they are ignoring him. They don't care about how he feels. It's about themselves. 
their arrogant mindset to just lift themselves up. We don't find out how he feels. Some of you don't know that God has feelings. He does. You know, the Bible says that uh, there will be joy in heaven over a sin and that repents, isn't it? It takes feelings to, to feel joyful. Jesus called them a wicked and adulterous generation that seeks after signs all the time. And in, in the book of Matthew chapter 16, he said, no sign shall be given unto them except for the sign of Jonah. So they've already had the sign. So what are they looking for again? That speaks about generations that is always looking for signs and wonders before they can believe God. Of course, we know the Bible says that without signs and wonders, these people will not believe. Amen? But that is just to attract. That is not, that is to bring in. That is not, I mean, the Bible says that miracles are children's bread. If you are established as a son in your house, your daddy does not need to perform any gimmicks for you to enter the house. You have the access to the house. Because you are born into that house. That's why the Bible speaks. It says, he that is born of God does not sin. Because now you have that code. Oh, glory to God. That code inside of you that helps you not to sin. That when you see the appearance of sin alone, it will disgust you. But in the congregation of sinners, they don't even see the appearance of sin. They convert the appearance of sin. And when the Bible says that we should flee from all the appearances of the enemy. Let's join in into the book of, uh, you know, um, before we go into that scripture, I'm, I'm about to read uh, Luke 16. You can write it down or open to it. Luke chapter 16. Uh, I'm going to start reading from verse 13. I'm just going to say this. One of the reasons why it is worrisome, which I explained earlier, is this. I wrote this down. I said, we have many that sit in the house of God. Pretending that God is their husband, Jesus, who is the husband of the church, is, is whom they pledge their loyalty to. But they still engage with dark spirits. They still, you know, in, in, they still engage intimately with the kingdom of darkness. It's like a woman who claimed to be married, alright, but still engage with another man outside a matrimonial home. What do you expect that husband to be? He will be jealous. God told the children of Israel some point in time. He said, don't you know that I'm a jealous God? Amen. Amen. So let's go to Luke chapter 16 and uh, read from verse 13. You know, this scripture I'm about to read to us explains how Jesus was surrounded by these dogs who lives in shamelessness. Jesus was teaching, was speaking. He said, no servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other. Or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Do you see another dimension there? He was actually speaking to the Pharisees, by the way. Verse 40 says, now the Pharisees who are lovers of money. Because mammon is... Actually talking about money. Alright? So, who are lovers of money also heard all these things. And they derided him. They hated him. Who is this guy who wants to take business away from us? In verse 15, and he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men. But God knows your heart. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Pause. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were the custodians of the law. They know the very five uh, books of Moses of him. They can recite it at heart. Are you with me? Amen. In other words, they are in church as it were, but they were congregations of sinners. We have them in today's church. Be careful when you see them. Two things. 
They are lovers of money. That's number one. Congregations of sinners love money. They don't, it's not about you needing money now. It's about loving money. And the Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evils. The love of it, the love of money will make you do anything to get money. Anything. It does not matter. You can kill to get money. You can, you know, swindle people to get money. You can cajole people to get money. It's not based on service anymore. It's based on anyhow. That is the congregation of sinners. And we have pastors that do this. In verse, uh, verse 15, it talks about, you know, Jesus was telling them, saying, you are those who justify yourselves before men. Now, when people, when believers, which I have seen, I mean, over the years, try to justify themselves based on what people think, it disturbs my heart. Because you are not called by God and by, by people. You are not saved by people. You are saved by God through the blood of Jesus Christ that he shed on the cross of Calvary. Who should be your justifier? God. Not what people say. People can call you names. People can praise you. People can elevate you and say you are the best pastor on earth. Is God saying so? At some point in time, there was a king in the Bible. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for reminding me. Who spoke? And the people said, wow, this sounds like the voice of God. And immediately, God struck him. Worms came upon him. Don't be deceived by what people are saying to you. Engross yourself in what God is saying to you. Amen. What God says is who you are. That is why even if the whole world says you are nothing, if God says you are something, oh, I've read my Bible enough to know. He always brings something out of nothing. In verse 15, he established what is highly esteemed among men. <laughs> It is an abomination in the sight of God. So which means there are some things people do in church that we lift high and we raise above the standard of God. And we, in fact, it's, it's not God, it's now man. The Bible says that it is an abomination in the sight of God. These are the congregation of sinners. The congregation of the wicked. When we talk about the wicked, don't think about the guy that is not born again, no. The guy that is born again, that knows the truth, and knows the scripture, but standing against what the word of God says, he is a wicked person. I repeat that. When we mention the word wicked, don't think about someone who does not know God, or somebody who is not born again. Think about the man or the woman who is born again, who knows the scriptures, who has dined with the Lord, who has partaken of the precious gift of God, and yet standing against God's purpose. That is a wicked person. In verse 16, Jesus continued to speak. He said, the law and the prophets were until Job. Since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is pressing into it. Everybody say, everyone is pressing into it. Everyone is pressing into it. So that means we all need to keep pressing in. The kingdom of God is where we keep on pressing in. You don't get satisfied about yesterday. You keep going on. Until you begin to experience. In fact, the more you experience more of God, the more you have the energy of the Spirit to press in. In verse 17, it says, And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one little of the Lord to fail. Verse 18 says, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced from her husband commits adultery. Amen. Amen. Now listen to this. The Pharisees and the Sadducees have this culture or they have this belief that they are above God. Alright? That they are above every person around them. 
because they believe they know the law of God and no one else does. So Jesus came and began to reset and relay the foundation properly for the people. Because here, the Pharisees and Sadducees, they just divorced their, their wives easily. I mean, a little argument, <laughs> they kicked them out. So they, they joyfully do that because they be I another sister. <laughs> oh, may the Lord have mercy. So, I mean, Jesus basically began to teach that whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. Now, we're going to be talking about, I'm going to talk about this in the core value of it, all right? Let's open to Matthew chapter 5 and see what Jesus said in verse 32. Because we're talking about the power of the dogs that surround. He's talking about the congregation of sinners. He says, deliver me from the power of dogs. Shamelessness. Shameful acts. Things that should not be mentioned among the saints of God. That are being done. Matthew chapter 5 verse 32. The Bible says, but I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except for except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery and whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. Now, first, and listen, Jesus was setting a rule here. It has always been a rule, but Jesus was bringing it out in the light of I mean, if you go back to uh, uh, in the Old Testament, you know, where uh, Moses had to give them a certificate of divorce. They asked Jesus after that, you know, that why is it then, if you are saying this, why is it then that Moses had to give certificate of divorce? And Jesus told them, he said, he did that because of the hardness of your heart. It was not like that from the origin. Okay? Now, Paul came in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Because we're going to use scriptures to judge scriptures, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And Paul came and began to explain. He also started with the same foundation. Because we he, he, divorce shouldn't be as rampant as it is right now. You proclaim to the whole world that you love him or you love her. Two weeks down the road, you started complaining. And you think you want to leave. You don't think you can handle it anymore. Two weeks. A year down the road. Oh no. You're already eyeing another man outside at your workplace. Or you're already eyeing another, another lady. Or to make it worse, you're already eyeing your housemate. Mm -hmm. Stop it. Let's look at what Paul said here. From verse 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. Now to the marriage I command, yet not I but the Lord. A wife is not to depart from her husband, but even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and a husband is not to divorce his wife. Is that in your Bible? Am I reading the right chapter? All right, good. Verse 12 says, But to the rest I, not the Lord, say, If any brother has a wife who does not believe, and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. Now you can see two different issues here. Now we have a believer and we have an unbeliever getting married. Alright, let's keep what reading. Verse 30 says, And a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. Verse 14 says, For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. But now they are holy. Verse 15 is one of my punchlines, and it speaks loud. It says, But if the unbeliever departs, let him do what? Let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. Hello, church. This in a nutshell, bring us to an understanding of a situation whereby when one, either of the parties decides 
to leave, even though it is not to the choice of the other party. Are you with me? You cannot force yourself into a marriage that you are not loved in. Hello, church. But right now, Jesus was so emphatic, and Paul was emphatic of here too, that look, it's not just something you wake up in the morning and just really listen, okay, I think I'm going to divorce this guy. Or I think I'm going to divorce this lady. Why? Because she got me angry last night. Really? How would you feel if Jesus thought decided to divorce you because you got him angry? How many of us will remain in the kingdom? How many of us? But once it gets to an extreme, because there are a lot of cases in the body of Christ that makes people to say, ah, no, you got to stay there. If, if, if you're right, if you're, let me put it this way, if your life is being threatened, please don't stay there. A threatened life is not equal to peace. <laughs> I think I wrote something here. I said, in other words, do not force yourself in a hostile marriage because that is one of the characteristics of an unbeliever. Hostility is not the same thing as peace. Don't say, no, God is going to change him. You've been with him two years, three years, four years, five years, you know, ten years, and you're still believing. And he keeps hitting you every day. Or she keeps ignoring you every... I hear a lot. And I know of a very good brother who told me his wife has denied her a, 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 a right, I mean, denied him, pardon me. His wife denied him his right to her for over two years. Two years. But she can gallivant around and do whatever she wants. That is punishment. There is need for quick restoration in that home. That woman needs to be talked to seriously. Now, why am I saying all of this? I mean, it's in the line with the scripture we are sharing. It says, the Bible says that if the unbeliever decides to leave, let him. Or her go. So there's no relationship between hostility and peace. In other words, a sexually perverted generation disgusts God. That's why he lays so much emphasis on this act. You'll find some men from this to that to that to that. Even when they say they are married, they, are, they still have like <laughs> maybe one, two, three, four, five outside they still eye or they still go to see I mean, there is no sanity in their mind no sanity and God wants us to bring sanity to our minds Amen, Amen. that's why this dogs have encompassed me you, you know, dogs have no, no shame they can just mate anyhow and that's what some men and women are engaging with in this generation. Congregation of the dead. Sorry, congregation of sinners. They always end up as congregation of the dead, by the way. Let's look at uh, the book of Numbers chapter 16. We're going to see congregation arising within congregation. Oh, the Lord, we help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Numbers 16. I start reading from verse 1. Congregation of sinners. Now, Korah, the son of Ishar, the son of Kohart, the son of Levi, I need you to note that this man is of the generation of the priests, the generation of Levi, separated by God to serve God. Alright? That's where Korah is from. Korah is not, uh, is not a stranger to the doctrines of God. Korah knows God. He knows the word of God. He knows what God has separated him to do. 
So what he's doing here, he's doing it deliberately. So listen. He's with Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. These three categories of people, they took men. And they rose up before Moses with some of the children of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation. So these guys have influence. They have both influence and affluence. They, they, can, they can stir up a group of people. Imagine 250 leaders. You can imagine the people that are under those leaders too. Let's keep reading. Uh, verse 2. And they rose up before Moses with some of the children of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation, representatives of the congregation, men of renown. They gathered together against Moses and Aaron and they said to them, you take too much upon yourselves. For all the congregation is holy, every one of them. And the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? Amen. Amen. Now this is an open rebellion. Standing against those that are ordained to be the leadership of, of the children of Israel. Now because, you see, because they... They believe God that God speaks to them. I think last week we talked about uh, uh, Aaron and uh, Miriam standing against Moses, you know. But today is now Korah, Deuteron, and Abram against Moses and against Aaron. Now, this group of guys also believe, after all, God is speaking to us too. We know, don't worry yourself, the congregation is already holy. You don't, I mean, who made them holy? By whose sanctification? By whose proclamation? In other words, they want to, they also want to have their, their sh fair share of leadership. We also want to be there. We want, we want to sit in that throne and let people see us too. You are not the only one. You guys are getting old. I mean, your days are going. Let the younger generation handle this matter. No! You are not God. The way you do your earthly business is different from the way you do church business. If you want to sit in the congregation of the righteous, you have to learn this. Know your place. Verse 4. So, when Moses heard it, he fell on his face and he spoke to Korah and all his company, saying, Tomorrow morning the Lord will show who is his and who is holy, and will cause him to come near to him. That that one whom he chooses, he will cause to come near to him. Do this. That's verse 6. Take senses, Korah, and all your company, put fire in them, and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. And if and it shall be that the man whom the Lord chooses is the holy one. You take too much upon yourselves, you sons of Levi. Do you see what Moses called them? Sons of the Levi. So you know the, where they are coming from. Alright? In verse 8. Then Moses said to Korah, Hear now, you sons of Levi, is it a small thing to you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to him, to do the work of the tabernacle of the Lord, and to stand before the congregation to serve them? And that he has brought you, and that he has brought you near, to himself, you and all your brethren, the sons of Levi, with you. And are you seeking the priesthood also? Hey, stay in your lane, no. I was sharing with someone recently, I said, hey, listen. Every preacher or everyone called by God has a message. One of the things that makes each person unique, it is what God has asked them to do, period. What God has sent me to do is different from what God has sent another preacher to do. I will not look at another preacher or another person's ministries to judge my ministry. Are you with me? If I do that, then I'll be a fool because Bible, to start with, the Bible says that those that judge them, um, those that, uh, how does it put there? Uh, 
judge themselves among themselves, they are fools, you know. Those that compare, not the, not the word judge, those that compare themselves among themselves, they are fools to start with. That's, there's no wisdom in that. In, 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 and secondly, each person will be rewarded according to what he's been sent to do. Okay, it's very simple. If, out of my children, if I sent one to go do this, and I send the other to go do another thing, if I say, you iron my shirt, you polish my shoe, the other one with, that is asked to iron the shirt, we know that polishing the shoe is easier. Let's exchange. Ah, uh, you can't exchange. The word has gone forth. You iron my shirt. You polish my shoe. So they will receive blessings from their father if they do that specific things they've been asked to do. Amen. 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 Even though if I wear the shoes and I'm walking in a, on the road that is so dusty, the shoe will get dusted. I mean, dusty. Amen. And the shirt might still remain okay. You don't say, no, God has only given me the ministry of the, of the shoe. I want, I want that of the shirt also. Stay in your lane. Amen. 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 Stay in your lane. Mm -hmm. So, Moses was talking to this guy. You are supposed to know better. God has called you out already. He has given you an assignment. So, are you seeking something? You want to take the priesthood also? In verse, uh, what verse are we right now? Verse 11. Now, Moses continued to speak, said, Therefore, you, excuse me, um, excuse me, I just, amen. 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 Verse 11. Amen. Therefore, you and all your company are gathered together against the Lord. Did you hear what Moses said? Mm, yeah. Be careful who you talk against. Because you are not speaking against them, you are speaking against the one who sent them. Mm. That's why I want to encourage anyone that cares to listen. Stop speaking evil about preachers, about ministers of God. Stop. If you don't like what they are doing, just take yourself out of that domain. Here, you can remember what Miriam and Aaron also did. They think they can speak because Moses is their younger brother. And they began to speak against him because he married an Ethiopian woman. What is their business? Leave that for God to judge. Now, Korah, Dathan, and Abraham also rose up in an open rebellion against Moses. Now, the point is, does it mean that we cannot correct our leaders? No. There's a way you approach them. There's a way you ask questions. And if you are not satisfied and you believe the Lord is leading you out of that place, excuse yourself. Stop talking against them because you'll be talking against the person who calls them. That was what Moses said here. You and all your company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron that you complain against him, by the way? And Moses sent to call Dathan and Abraham, the sons of Eliab, but they said, we will not come. That's another open uh, 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 disrespect. Mm -hmm. And they are being rude. Mm -hmm. Is it a small thing that you have brought us up out of the land, flowing with milk and honey, to kill us in the wilderness, that you should keep acting like a prince over us? That was the thing they were thinking about Moses. They thought he was acting like prince over them. May we have understanding of God. Amen. Moreover, you have not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, nor given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Will you put out the eyes of those men? We will not come up. So they, this was their reply to, to Moses. Then Moses was very angry. Like Americans we say, he was mad. In the case of Aaron and Miriam, he was not mad. He went, in fact, it was God that dealt with the case. But in this case, he went before the Lord. He was angry and said to the Lord, Do not respect their offering, because these are the guys that offer offering to God. 
I have not taken one donkey from them, nor have I hurt one of them. That's a good leader. And Moses said to Korah, Tomorrow you and all your company be present before the Lord, you and they as well as Aaron. Let each take his censer and put incense in it, and each of you bring his censer before the Lord, 250 censers, both you and Aaron, each with his censers. So every man took his censer, put fire in it, laid incense on it, and stood at the door of the tabernacle of meeting with Moses and Aaron. And Korah gathered, listen to this, verse 19, and Korah gathered all the congregation, all the congregations against them, at the door of the tabernacle of meeting, then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the congregation. Now listen, these guys have influence. They turn all the congregation against Moses and Aaron. And because they, 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 this, this, this is the height of rebellion. They move people. So let's, is he the only one that God can use? God speaks to us too. In fact, God, God, God separated our family. <laughs> Not even Moses' family, huh? but our family. To be ministering to the Lord. Stay in your lane, no. So, in verse 20, and the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Separate yourself from among this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. God does not have time for nonsense. God was ready to destroy them immediately. Born. In fact, they will evaporate. Thank God for mercy that we receive in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. But unfortunately, we still have this kind of group of people even in churches today. They are congregations of sinners. These ones, they are rise among the congregation of the righteous. So, then, that's verse uh, 20. Then they fell on their faces and said, Oh God, that's Aaron and Moses and Aaron. Oh God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin and you be angry with all the congregation? Because some of those congregations, they just follow, they said we should go and we just, they just go. They are like foolish people who just, they don't ask questions, they just go. Moses discerned that and pleaded on their behalf before Oh God. Verse 23. So the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the congregation, saying, Get away. That is it. That is the key thing. Get away from the tents of Korah, Dath, and, Al and Abiram. These are spiritual leaders. Korah, Dath, and Abiram are spiritual leaders recognized in Israel, separated by God. Korah is of the descendants of the Levites. But God is saying, separate yourself from their camp. As long as you see any leader perpetrating evil all in the name of submission, or all in the name of following me, separate yourself from them. When they begin to, they can do anything to get money. They don't mind maneuvering people, giving prophecies that is not from the throne of God. They will have done some evil stuff and giving you your bank account and uh, telling you your, 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 the name of your forefathers and you'll be shaking before them. No, that is not of God. They are Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And you're going to see what is going to happen to them. Congregation of sinners. And he spoke to the congregation saying, Depart now from the tents of the of these wicked men. That's why I say that the congregation of sinners are the congregation of the wicked people. Mm -hmm. Touch nothing of theirs, lest you be consumed in all their sins. Do you see? Verse 27 says, So they got away from around the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood at the door of their tents with their wives, their sons, and their little children. Mm -hmm. You see, what one act can cause a whole generation. That is why I want to recommend, please, fathers, be careful. 
Because Lord have mercy. One negative act can send a terrible signal down your generation that when you are no more even here, they, be, they continue to suffer it. Until any of them begin to find their way in Christ and they can disconnect from it from your lineage and get reconnected into the lineage of Jesus Christ. So, and there are little children, verse 28, and Moses said, by this you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them by my own will. If these men die natural, naturally like all men, or if they are visited by the common faith of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord creates a new thing, hey, hey, hey. so this is how I know that this was the first uh, uh, earthquake <laughs> or, or, pit, or what we call a sinkhole or something, you know. He says, but if the Lord creates a new thing, that's the study, and the earth opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that belongs to them, and they go down our life into the pit. Then you will understand that these men have rejected the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a congregation of sinners and wicked that thought they are alive. Mm -hmm. Because they are going down alive. They are not dead and buried. This one, they are going down alive. Mm -hmm. This is the first earthquake or sinkhole that ever existed. Because Moses said, if the Lord will create what? A new thing. Mm -hmm. So it was new. And you know what happened afterwards? In verse uh, 20, 31. All right, thank you. Now it came to pass as he finished speaking all these words that the ground split apart under them, under them alone. And the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households and all the men with Korah, with all their goods. So they and all those with them went down alive into the pit. The earth closed over them and they perished from among the assembly. They end up in the congregation of the dead. How does this Old Testament teachings, you know, transpose into New Testament? Understand this. I will not over, I mean, overemphasize it. Stay in your lane. Mm. Whatever God has asked you to do, do it. The other preacher is not doing well. It's none of your business. Mm. The other pastor is, is preaching heresy. It's none of your business. Just make sure that the people God has sent you to, you open the scriptures to them so that they don't get into the error that they hear from another place. Mm. Period. Jesus. I don't think you can finish this today. You know. Jesus came up and said, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not work. Prevail it. Over it. The gate of hell shall not overcome it. Now. Why does Jesus have to build his church or another church? Don't forget what the word church means. It's, talking, it's ecclesia and it simply means a call out people, a different people that are called out for a specific purpose. That's what the word church means. So it's not the building, it's not the structure, it's the people. Alright? And already before Jesus came, the synagogue was there. Are you with me? And people are already gathering there. And they were not gathering for gathering. They were gathering unto the Lord. According to the law of Moses. When Jesus came, Jesus recognized that he also went to the synagogue. Amen. That is the place that was regarded as the place where people can talk to God. And in fact, Jesus talks in the synagogue. Are you with me? So, but when Jesus saw how the so-called custodians of the law were handling the law. 
He said, nah, 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 nah. this does not tally with what the Lord has sent me. I think I need to build my own assembly. I need to build my own church. I need to build those so that I can teach them every raw, give them every raw material that the Father has given me so that they can run the race the way the Father wanted it to be run. That was what he meant when he said, and I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail it. If the gate of hell is prevailing any denomination, that denomination is not in the category of the church of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 I don't want to deviate, but I just want to stay, stay, stay in line. Because another thing started coming to my mind, I just as I mentioned that right now. Amen. In, ver in the book of Mark chapter 8, I don't know, uh, no, Mark 16, not 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 uh, not Mark. Matthew 16. Matthew 16. Verse. Uh, let's start reading from verse uh, five. From verse five, Jesus and the Bible says that now when his disciples had come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of the living of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, Jesus began to warn his own congregation right now. Are you with me? You will only hear Jesus confronting the Pharisees and the Sadducees when they confront him openly. Jesus does not take his bag and baggages and went to them and begin to castigate them. No. Anytime they come to Jesus' meeting, or they try to ask him one funny questions, he will give it back to them. That's where he will, he will start hearing him say, Woe unto you, Pharisees, for you only mind the type of means and conics, but you have neglected what? The weightier matters of the law. But Jesus began to teach after this event of, uh, of, of, of calling them adulterous generations that seeks only signs and, you know, you know, and he said, there's no other signs that will be given to them. Jesus began to teach his own people. And he said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And what leaven was he talking about? Verse 7 says, and they reason among themselves, that the disciples saying, it's because we have, we have taken no bread. So all they are taking is food. <laughs> Verse 8 says, but Jesus, beware, I mean, being aware of it, said to them, oh, you of little faith, why do you reason among yourself because you have brought no bread? Do you not understand or remember the five loaves of the five thousand and the, how many baskets you took up? Not the seven loaves of the four thousand and how many light baskets you took up? Verse 11 is the punchline. How is it you do not understand? What did we emphasize last week? Understanding. How is it you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread? but to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Mm. Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Mm. The teachings mm. of the congregation of sinners, the teachings of the congregations of the dead, be careful of it. Because it's like a leaven. You know what a leaven is like? It's a yeast. Once you mix yeast with the flour, it makes it buff, mm -hmm. uh -huh, isn't it? Then you make it. You can make a dough out of it. It's pride. That buffness is pride. Mm -hmm. It's arrogance. It's, 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 I mean, it will make you to be rude against God's purpose. Mm -hmm. So Jesus began to warn his congregation, guys, don't even partake of it. Because it will draw you back to the congregation of sinners and the congregation of the dead. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I will build my church. Is I will build my own congregation that will only respond to my authority, my presence, and my dictates. To build with others or build along the same path of others that has been will be to have a mixed multitude with no specific direction towards the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I said earlier, the word church means ecclesia. It's a called out people. People called out of 
you know, error. The people called out of the congregation of sinners, the people called out of the congregation of the dead, but now called into the congregation of the righteous. Amen. 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 So the congregation of the righteous is established. I think I'm finishing it today by the grace of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, let's go to Psalm 1 from verse 5. The Bible says that therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. The congregation of the righteous is the congregation of the mighty. Just like the congregation of sinners is the congregation of wicked. The congregation of, of the righteous is what? The congregation of the mighty. I just read Psalm 1 verse 5. Is that, is that okay in your Bible? Amen. Amen. Now let's go to Psalm 82. And we'll start reading from verse, I mean read, we'll read verse 1. Psalm 82, it says, God stands in the congregation of the mighty, he judges among the gods. Hello church. God stands in the congregation of the mighty, which is the congregation of the righteous. Because when you are righteous and you stand in your place, you don't walk around with perverted, sexually perverted people. You will be righteous, believe you me. And because God will have access into your life. That's why the Bible says that God will stand there. He will stand in our midst. Because we are the congregation of the mighty. And once you are righteous, you, you will gain eternal and divine might. To overcome your struggles in life. Mm. And the Bible says that he judges among the gods. That's where the, the Bible says that ye are gods. Amen. Amen. That's where God judges. Amen. Amen. Verse, uh, let's go to Psalm 89 verse 7. And I conclude with that. Psalm 89 verse 7. The Bible says, God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints. And to be held in reverence by all those around him. In other words, in the congregation of the righteous, the people hold God in high esteem, not the men around them. We hold God. We should hold God in high esteem. He should be greatly feared. And to be held in reverence by all those around him. This is the characteristics of the congregation of the righteous. We hold God in high esteem. We reverence Him. We fear Him. If you know God, you'll be afraid of Him. And I mean practically afraid. Because when He decides to open up His anger, none of us can stand Him. That's why the sword of God, when it goes out, it goes in judgment. But while it's coming back, you better be on this other side. Because it comes back with mercy. Amen. Amen. When it goes out, it goes out with judgment. When it comes back, it comes back with what? With mercy. That's the two sides of the, that's the two edges sword of God. So the side you position yourself is the side you will receive. It keeps going back and forth. That's why you need to stay on this side. <laughs> stay close to him. Mm. So that when each time he comes back, you'll be receiving mercy, 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 mercy. Mm. Don't cross over to the other side. It's dangerous. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to uh, finish with this and conclude to encourage us. Please, don't stay in a domain whereby the power of dogs have influence over your life. Get out of it. And the Lord will bless you richly. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let us pray. Amen. Thank you, Heavenly Father, because you're a faithful God. Thank you because you're righteous. And thank you because you have imputed your righteousness into us. Thank you for making us to be righteous. Blessed be your holy name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for speaking your word to us. We ask for divine capacity and ability to walk this path of righteousness without looking back, without wavering, 
without swerving on the way so that we keep our eyes single looking at you who is the author and the finisher of our faith in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.